the session. We're doing an R Studio crash course. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. Oh, let me. There's also um, a tiny URL that's going to hyperlink to all of the different files we'll be using today. The oh, uh, Nazir, would you be able to make me a? Oh, I think yeah. it's some different issues with the screen. Oh, never mind. It's working now. There we go. Cool. I'm just trying to make sure I still share my screen. This is working out perfectly. Um, so we're going to go ahead and. We'll be mostly using the hs.sav file. This is a Holzinger and Swine for 1939 um, data set. It's looking at different educational tests, and it's a really, really common toy data set to use. So we'll be using that today. And then there's a couple of QMD files. QMD files are essentially R scripts. It's um, it's an annotated version of it, though. And we're going to talk through all of these things, what these things all mean. And then... <clears throat> There's also instructions if you haven't installed r, &R Studio. Um, there's instructions of how to go about doing that step by step. Um, out of quick, let's see, if you will do this, the reactions icon, um, can you go ahead and give me a, a quick thumbs up if you have r, &R Studio installed and a thumbs down if you don't? And if you don't, that's okay. Oh, um, I see a question. Oh, feel free to go ahead and uh, unmute if you want. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was mean to sum up. Oh, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, um, yes, yeah, so it looks like everyone has it already installed. Um, if not, uh, no worries. Um, happy to kind of talk through that or uh, later on too, if you have any questions or if there's like specific types of analysis you want to learn how to use within R, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to go ahead and put my email in the chat right now, too. That way you have it. Um, I love talking about R. I'm a huge R user. It's like my go-to software. Um, so <clears throat> before we get started, out of curiosity, um, who's used R before? Okay. So I see a couple. That's awesome. Um, so I'm not I'm not going to assume any prior knowledge within R within this. And then as we go through, I'm going to try doing some live coding, which is always just a recipe for disaster. Um, but we'll see how that goes. There's a there's two versions of the script that we're going to be using today. There's one version that's a template, so that doesn't have any, anything really filled in. It's a it's a real template, so that way we can actually go through. It. I'll do using that today. There is a completed one that has annotations in it. So if you use that hyperlink that's within, let me go ahead and just repaste this again into the chat. That way you all have it. And I'm not going to like take down the Google Drive or anything like that. So you'll have access to this. Um, I also put these on my GitHub page too, because uh, I'm a big proponent of open coding, open data, uh, just because that's that's how I learned. So I, I always want to kind of pay it forward. So. What we want to do first is once you've went ahead and you've downloaded these onto your computer, I went ahead and I put them all into a folder. It's called our crash course. I have some additional stuff in there. Um, it's mostly just the installation stuff, email, stuff like that. But what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and double click on the R template, and that's going to open up the QMD file. Now, a QMD file, it's a, it's a variation of an R script. Let me go ahead and drag this over to the main screen that we can see it. There we go. This will take a second to initialize. It's it's an R script, but the nice thing is it's using a what's called Quattro, which is a second generation R markdown type of setup. But the nice thing is it can also work within Python, within Julia. So you can use other software systems within this, within R Studio as well. But the benefit is like you can have this when you write up your code. It's all inverted. So like if you're using like SPSS or Stata or SAS, those programs assume every line that you write is code. And you have to put comments out. Otherwise, it's going to think that your comment is a code. With the QMD file, it's flipped. So everything is assumed a comment. And then you have what's called a chunk. And this chunk is essentially just where we would write in all of our code. So we can actually, if we wanted to, it'd be like, um, if we want to do two plus two, 
we can either press control enter within that line or what i like to do is i would like to use this run chunk we have a little output window and the nice thing is it's all on a single page so what we could do is we could actually if once we're done with our script i can go ahead and i can have this generate like an html page or a pdf or a word document so actually i use this a lot for generating reports and documentations also for tutorials, uh, because I like having lots of annotations. My memory is horrible. It is really, really bad. And if you ask any of my coworkers, they'll they'll confirm that it's it's really bad. Uh, so within this, so I'd like to make heavy annotations. That way, I know what I'm doing, and I can go back to this a couple weeks later, and I have that kind of notes for myself. And this is also really, really good for any sort of research project that using R with, because now you have your research log built into your code. So then I can go ahead and like, if there's someone that's um, interested in my code and wants to learn like a different technique I'm using, I can just share with them the annotated code. It has all my code and all my notes in it. And that way it makes it really easy to get up and running with this. I mean, you can use base R code, that's perfectly fine. But just for teaching purposes or just for like single projects, it's not efficient coding, but I really love it because it has all these notes and I don't have to have a separate document somewhere or have all these like comment quotes in there. Um, so once you're done with all the coding, you hit the render button. We're not going to hit that until the end yet, but that's where it's going to go ahead and create like a, a PDF or an HTML or Word doc. If you're trying to do like a PDF, there's some additional things you have to install. So we're mostly going to just be focusing on HTML for now. Um, if you're interested in something like doing a PDF or a Word doc, and you can actually write like entire articles and manuscripts in R2, because it's you can have it use a LaTeX compiler to then write the manuscript and kind of compile it over to it. So it makes it really easy. Uh, but if you're interested in learning more about that, let me know. Happy to chat more. But if you're, this way, it's just going to be kind of get into the basics within this and then get you up and running with it. So I'm not going to go into like the details of like certain statistical analyses or the pros and cons or like really detailed data cleaning, just because that's kind of outside the scope. Think of this more as like an, an intro to R, just to get you up and running with it. Uh, but always happy to talk, go into much more detail stuff. Uh, I know I could probably talk on a tangent for a while about R and some features, but I'm going to try to avoid that. Um, so when you first open up R Studio, this is what it looks like. Uh, typically, you might not have you might not have this. Let me go ahead and close out of this. You might not have that upper window open. If you don't, what you need to do is you want to go to that folder button, find where you went ahead and downloaded the R template QMD file, and click on open. And that's going to go ahead and put that in there. So this is your R script, um, and this is just headers now. Within yours, it might default to what's called a visual format. I like using source code because that's just more what I'm accustomed to. Uh, my partner uses visual for all of her work. Um, same thing, and it's perfectly fine. Uh, with visual, you can see how it's going to be actually rendering. So when you have it poured over to an HTML or write to a PDF or a Word doc, you can see what it's actually going to look like. Um, and yeah, it's, it's not on the version that has just added this, but... Yeah, live coding. What could possibly go wrong today? So we're, we're going to test that to the limit. Um, but the nice thing is this gets you an idea of like what it's going to look like at the end of this. And it's pretty, it's, it's pretty nice. It's much better for me than trying to read through like SAS or Stata comments. Uh, but again, it's personal preference. Now, the benefit here to the visual is you could do some cool things with your comments. So if I wanted to like bold certain words or use italics or like put a bullet point in you can do that if you even wanted to do something like let me open up the crash the, the completed code and then move this over to visual so i mean like in the source it doesn't it's really not all that meaningful but when you actually print it out you could actually include a table so this is my strategic plan of how to be, have everyone become a Bayesian for when it comes to statistics. And thank you all. You're in that first step now. Can you to use R? I'm not sure about the middle step, but third step, you're now Bayesian. So uh, it's a work in progress plan. Uh, we'll see if it actually works. But you can actually add tables. You can add in images, uh, bullet points. 
Um, you can also add in references. You can have it linked with Zotero. So you can actually do a lot of stuff with this. And you can even have like, you can add headers. So that way it makes it easier to skim the code. I'm a big proponent of having headers because I can click on this outline button here in my code and I can jump down to certain sections. So that way I'm not having to scroll through everything. And as long as you have, so if you have a one, a pound symbol, it's going to be a, a level one header. Then the two is a level two, three is a level three. And you get the idea. But that's essentially what this type of code will look like. So this is where all of your code, when you write stuff up, you can have it here because it's a chunk too, because we have these little gray boxes here. So if I run this, we're going to have an output chunk. We have an input chunk. So if, you, if you're if you familiar with like Jupyter Notebook, it, it's kind of like something like that. It's really similar to that idea to it. Um, the benefit with this is you have your code, you have your annotations, and you have your output all within a single document. This down below here, this is the console window. So it's actually just base R. So you can go ahead, you can run all your analysis in base R. I know some folks who do that. It drives me bonkers because you can't replicate stuff. Um, I'm a big proponent of reproducibility of results. So having this script, I can go ahead and just update the data, rerun it. And that saves a lot of time and energy rather than having to rewrite and redo everything. Uh, so this is the console window. Uh, you probably won't use the, all that much, though, if you're using this type of format. But you can definitely do this. I use this for, like, really quick tests just to make sure, like, I recode a variable, make sure everything's working right. This upper right-hand quadrant, this is the window environment. So R is an object-oriented language. An object is really anything you make of it. I know that's really not helpful, but it could be like a list or a vector of numbers. It could be a list or vector of words. It could be a data frame. It could be a an image, right? A figure, all the code for that. So really it could also be a function. It could be take a lot of different things. Um, the nice thing is you can have multiple data sets open at the same time. So it's easy to subset and combine and kind of splice your data and reconfigure stuff. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, there's also the tutorial button. So if once you first start with it, you can actually learn R within R. So you can actually start tutorials. Uh, this is all built in within the R Studio system. I immediately regret that decision now. Um, oh, it's doing something. Okay. Um, so... I'm clicking on stuff I haven't used before, so I haven't used the tutorial button, but actually this will walk you through of how to use R within R. It has little different topics. So you can actually go through all these different modules. Uh, let me move the zoom header down a little bit. You can also go to, let's see, I think it is help. And there's actually R Studio documents and they also have R Studio cheat sheets. So if you're interested in, let's say, making a web application. You can click on that within R. It'll redirect you to the PDF. And then it has like these two page documents or cheat sheet on how to do stuff. So these are just massive, massive helps. At the bottom of the code, there's a bunch of different resources I would highly recommend. They're all open source, they're all free. Um, because R is open source free, you never have to pay a dime for it, you never should. And the big thing about this community is they want to help each other out, that they've all been there with trying to learn R, and they're just trying to make it easier for everyone else, too. So it's a really, really great community to be part of. In this lower right-hand quadrant, this is where you can see the different files that are within your working directory. You can look at different plots or images that you've created. And then you also have packages. So base R itself is pretty powerful. Um, however, a lot of the functionality and flexibility that you get with an R, if you're using stuff like looking at computational genomics, or you're looking at uh, Bayesian psychometrics, or latent variable modeling, multi-level modeling, or whatever type of analysis you're looking at, there's probably a package that someone made that's out there that has functions that will make it easy to use those. So, like, I do a lot of Bayesian psychometrics. That's what I love. So I will tend to maybe use like the R stand package or Blavon is actually a really good example. So there's like specific packages that are just 
created just for specific uh, disciplines and specific areas within those disciplines. So like if I wanted to use Blavon, like Bayesian latent variable modeling, I can go ahead and I can download this package and it has all these built-in feed or functions that folks have written that I can then use for my own work. So this is using a Bayesian confirmatory factor analysis and has all the different options. So it tells me what the code structure is and it gives me, it tells me specific each detail of how I would go about using those arguments. And then at the bottom of it, there's actually an example. So I can actually run this, I can copy this and paste this into my session and I can run it and replicate it. The nice thing is this is all standardized for all the packages out there through the R, the comprehensive R archive network or CRAN. So that's typically where you download all your packages from. Um, and we'll talk a moment. Actually, let's go ahead and talk about that now. Um, so that's the flexibility. This over, last time I checked, it was like 30,000 packages out there. Don't download them all. I used to know a guy at, in my grad school who would just run R. This was like 10 years ago. And just run it to get all the packages every week just for updates. Um, you don't have to do that. You really, really don't need to do that because it's you're never going to use most of those packages. But think of it as like a, an R package. It's a set of functions you can use. And think of it as um, like when you're downloading a package, you're putting a bulb into a light fixture. And then when you want to use that light fixture, use that function, you're just activating by flipping a switch. So that's kind of a, a good way to kind of think about it. You don't have to re-download your packages each and every time. You don't have to do that. Once you have it downloaded, you just have to activate it for your session. So what we're going to do is let's go ahead and we're going to create a couple of objects first, and then we're going to show, I'll walk you through how to activate or install and activate a package. So first we're going to do is let's go ahead and create a object called B. And so you'll, get, you'll see some arguments in, in the community about this. You can use the, you give the object a name. And then what I like to use is I use the less than symbol hyphen. And this is an assignment. So we're assigning something to the object we're calling B. And I'm going to do this as a list. So I'm doing C parentheses, one, two, three, four. So I'm going a list of four values. It's a vector essentially. So if I run this, hey, now I have something called B and it's numeric one, two, three, four. So if I wanted to see this, I can just go ahead and say, repeat the name of the object. Hey, there's my object. You can also do, rather than the lesson symbol hyphen, equal sign. Um, hey, hey, Eric, in the yep. chat, in someone saying they don't see the gray chunk at line 16. Are you in the, I, I guess I would ask, are you in the template code or are you in the crash course code? Because if you're in the template code, it should be. Should be an empty one. Never um, mind. They said they got it. Okay, perfect. Um, if you don't see that, actually, let me. Uh, this is actually a really good point too. If you don't see a code here or a a gray box, you can actually create one. So you can do this wherever you want. Right over here, there's a C with a green square and a plus icon. If you click on that, that's going to add a new code chunk. Um, so if you're in the crash course code, that's fine. If you want to add a new chunk. And I'm going to go ahead and just create a couple here. And so that way we have a couple of code chunks we can work with. Um, so again, if you ever wanted to create additional chunks, you can just insert it using here. Um, I'm one of those weird, weird folks who just goes like this and just creates it myself. Um, just because I keep on forgetting about that icon to use. Uh, but that's a really quick way you can go ahead and create that. So if you don't have one there, like we'll be adding them. Um, don't worry, just go ahead and click here and you can add a new one in there. And I always like to kind of add a quick notation like um, this is, actually I should put this with B. This is a list. Then if I run the screen arrow, it prints it out. Um, so again, like equal sign or this, it's all personal preference. I'm in the camp that likes the lesson symbol hyphen because that's how I was trained. It doesn't really matter though. Um, 
it, you feel for folks used to get really upset if you used one or the other it doesn't matter and if they get upset with you about it that's just silliness if i'm really honest the so this could be an object like this you can also do something that's like this is what's called a print function so it's literally the word print and then parentheses and then i'll put the object within it it's going to do the same thing as if you just said b so the nice thing with an R, there's tons of ways to do the same thing. The downside with R, there's tons of different ways to do the same thing. It's just, to, it's gonna drive you crazy. Uh, do what you like and do what you feel most comfortable with. That's my recommendation to you. There's multiple ways of doing the same thing. Find the method or the style that works best for you and for your workflow in a project. Um, don't let someone in tell you, oh, this is only this way and you should be doing it this way. That's, eh, I wouldn't do it that way for coding. Um, if you wanted to get rid of B, like let's say, oh, I was just messing around with this. I wanted to get rid of it. I can do something that's called RM. Let me do this in a different chunk. RM parentheses B. And that gets rid of B. But if I try to run this again now, it's going to give me a warning message saying, hey, there's no object, no object B found. Um, R's error messages used to be really, really oblique to say it nicely. Um, they've gotten a lot better. So it's a lot of times you can actually just take a warning, copy it. I do this all the time. I'll go into Google and I'll just say like R and I'm able to find the error usually. Uh, so with the R, Google is your friend. I cannot tell you how often I'm on Google search and stuff for R code and troubleshooting within it. Um, if, if you get an error, honestly copy and paste it into Google and it, there'll be kind of steps on how to fix it. Um, Cause if you're seeing it, someone else has seen it too. Um, so let's talk a little bit about packages. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit. So whenever you want to install a package, let me go ahead and make a new chunk here. So I'm gonna do install.packages, my favorite package of all time. Um, it sounds silly that I have a favorite package of all time, but it is, uh, is Y hat. It's for regression models. It's by some folks when I was in grad school, they created this package. So it's in their same program, just I loved it. I thought it was a really cool way to do different regression models. So um, that's what I use. So what this does is it actually goes ahead and it installs, it copies from CRAN, the binaries, it compiles everything. And now you have a subfolder within the program that has all these functions. And this is the manual way to do it. If you first get out started with R, what you can do instead is go to packages and there's a little install button. You can click there and I can type in, I'm typing Edstan. It's gonna autocomplete the name and you can actually add in multiple, um, multiple packages in there. So if I wanted to do like a differential item functioning, um, I can add in that too. You always wanna make sure you install dependencies. Um, this is why I like R compared to Python, because sometimes dependencies can be a pain within Python. R, it's a little bit easier, I found. You just wanna make sure that's checked, because that way, if there's anything that those packages require in terms of having them be able to use them, it's gonna install them as well. The nice thing is we have our different packages. Now, when you're first installing, you're only gonna have a couple of these. You're not gonna have each and everything in here. Um, but what you can do is you can go ahead and click on it and learn more about the specific, all the different functions in there and learn how to use it. Every single package within CRAN, I mentioned before it's standardized. So I can type in R CRAN Levon. And here's the CRAN website. I can click here. This web page looks, it looks like crap. I'll be honest, it looks like crap. But if I click on the reference guide, each and every CRAN or every package that's on CRAN has to have this type of formatted documentation. So you can actually, it's the same thing that we saw within R Studio. But I can go ahead, I can look at this, and I can actually pull up how to use a specific function. And there's all the information, and then it has built-in vignettes I can copy and paste and run it. So it's 
if there's certain things you run in, I would actually just Google search, be like, hey, if you use survival analysis, I would Google search our survival analysis. And you'll get a list of packages that would work for what you're trying to do. Um, the nice thing, you only have to install once. So that's why you'll never really see install packages within my code here. Uh, because if you're having to reinstall everything each and every time you run the code, that's not efficient. It's your computer's going to get bogged down with just doing that rather than what you want it to do. So once you have it installed, now we need to turn on that light switch. We have to activate that package. To do that, I'm going to go ahead in the console window here, in this lower one. I'm going to type in library, and I'll type in y hat. Hey, and now it's active. To make sure it's active, I can go to packages. I can search in this little search bar. Hey, there's y hat with a checkbox. Yay. If I wanted to deactivate, I can just uncheck it. And there's the corresponding code that deactivates it. So if you, if rather than typing out the code, if you wanted to select a package, you can just go ahead and select it through here as well. Um, I don't typically recommend that too much, just because if you're running code, you might forget to activate the stuff if you're doing it manually. So it's usually pretty good practice just to put the library activation codes in your code itself. Um, so this code is something that uh, my collaborator, Dr. Guan, that is the Bayesian psychometrics with me, um, had created too within this. So this is um, a quick way of making sure if you're sharing code with others, that it makes sure that their setup is gonna be able to do everything you want it to do. So here we just actually have a list of different R packages that we'll be using today. We're storing this as an object called list of packages. And what we're doing here is we're having this essentially go through all the packages that are installed on the computer and seeing if there's any that aren't installed, make a note of it. Store that as an object called new packages and then install it. So what this does is if you're not sure you have it or not and you don't want to search for it, you can run this code and it makes it just easier to pass on the data and for folks to be able to install stuff. That way you're not reinstalling each and everything, you're just installing what you need. Um, I personally, so out of curiosity, um, quick show of hands, who likes using scientific notation? Okay, awesome. Uh, more power to you. I I have a hard time with scientific notation. I, I'm lazy. I just don't want to do the mental gymnastics for that. So I, I tend to just like, okay, well, give me it in decimals. Give me it in an easier format that I can read. So what this is doing, it's a global option. So it's just going to be within the session that I can go ahead and change everything from scientific notation to non-scientific. So that's what this SciPen equals 999 is. So all of this just to be able to activate the packages. So we actually just were setting up our environment to be able to run stuff. Um, so the next thing, we're just going to activate Rio. So Rio allows you to import different data sets. So you can use like a proprietary data sets like SPSS data sets, SAS, Stata, um, a bunch of different other ones too. And then it just makes it easier. And it's super easy code compared to like Haven. So I really like Rio. That was a suggestion that um, an adjunct faculty over at SPA told me about and since then, I love it. It's so good to work with. Uh, Tidyverse is just a set of different, it's actually a package of packages. So it's a whole bunch of, it's a collection of packages to manipulate and look at data. There's the psych package. I'm in, I'm just an experimental psychologist. So I tend to do a lot with psychometrics and that type of stuff and descriptives. So I use the psych package a lot. We have Bruin, which is a way to look at model results really quickly and then performance check like assumptions. And I just run this whole chunk. That's all packages we'll need for now. And that's going to go ahead and activate all of those. And you'll get these messages that, well, some things aren't installed. That's okay. You'll see these conflicts. Um, don't worry about these. What, what's happening is because Tidyverse is that collection, one of the packages there is called dplyr. They have the same functions like filter that's in the base version of our there's a, there's a base function called filter. It's different than what dplyr is. So what's saying is because we activated dplyr, well, we're going to use this newer version rather than the base version. And that's what you see with this. Uh, it's not a big issue, but I just want to mention that just so you know.
Um, if you're teaching with R or getting started with R, this is going to be the biggest, biggest, biggest headache is setting the working directory. So think of it as you have your code, your data set in a file. Think of it as, well, that's that's your, um, your storage bin for your project. All your stuff's in there. Well, you need to tell R where that bin is so it can access it. I used to use a set working directory, the code for it, but if I go to share this code with you all and I have my working directory, well, my my path file directories are going to be different than what's on yours. So it's it's actually better practice not to do that. Um, there used to be someone at our studio, they were famous for saying, if you're using set working directory, they're going to go find your computer and going to go set it on fire because you should not be doing that. Uh, so better practice. I'm not going to do that. Um, but what we do is you go to session set working directory and then if you have your r script in the same place as your data you can click source file location otherwise just choose like choose directory and then you'll be able to go through and because i have all the stuff in my r crash course this folder i created so i would just make sure it's in that folder click open and that does it for me so it's it's better practice this way um, it removes a lot of this um issues with file paths and so if you're teaching with r that's going to be the biggest headache um so if you students are doing that i would just use the the point and click option personally just to alleviate that headache uh, it happens and that's that's always the biggest thing what i like to do is to check to make sure where i'm working if i go to my files tab in this lower right if i don't see the files i want to work with in there then i know i'm not in the location i want to be so that's a quick check that I do. So now we actually get to pull in some data and actually start having some fun. Because um, right now it's kind of just setting the stage for things. But before we start doing that, I just wanted to take a quick check and just see, um, anyone have any questions so far? Uh, feel free to unmute if you want to put in the chat, whatever you want to do, just let me know if you have questions before we move on. I'm coming at this from Python, like a lot of <laughs> Python knowledge. So is it, when you mentioned the difference in sort of the assignment and you said that it doesn't make any powerful difference, I just wanted to confirm because obviously I'm coming from that kind of paradigm. Like if I go around and I stick equal signs as my assigned symbol everywhere, there's not going to be any issues with R. Oh, no issues, no issues at all. Okay. And actually, um, if you're if you're a heavy Python user, you can actually, you can run Python just within our studio as well. So um, the I think it was not published. Um, so I'm just using the base chunk here. Oops. Oh, I don't want to do that. I do not want to do that. So if I have a Python interpreter, it's going to go ahead. It's going to use Minicoda because that's why I have as current my build here. Actually, you can install it. So you can actually, um, you can have R talk to Python. You can have this entirely built within Python. If you didn't want to use like via, or, uh, VS Code or like uh, or Spider or anything, you can actually have this. Or if you wanted to like, leverage some of those really nice modules in Python, like uh, TensorFlow, uh, Pandas into R, you can do that. You can have them talk to one another, which is really cool stuff. Yeah. Um, if you're interested, let me know. I have like a, a handout and some information about a package called Reticulate. And that lets you talk to each other too. So it's it's a little weird at times where it has to pi or kind of port the data set back and forth, but you can really leverage the strengths of both of them though, for your workflow. Got it. Thank you. No um, I see another question about, can you explain what set working directory does? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, what set working directory does is it's, because when using R, and if you're not, if it's not saved, and you have like a brand new R session, it doesn't know where, where the data is or where it needs to store. So what you're doing is, um, you're kind of pointing R to the location. Oh, I guess I'm installing Minicoda now. Okay, so let's go ahead and do its thing then while I'm talking. Um, the 
it kind of just it points to the location that you file. So if you're working with a data set, you're just pointing R to that and kind of work out of that folder. So it's we're, we're, lo we're locating that storage bin, we're opening up the storage bin, and we're just rummaging through, and we're going to be working out of that. Um, so that's kind of what the set working directory will do. So when it says a uh, set WD, that's going to be just the function in R for set working directory. Um, let me know if that answers your question, or if not, just let me know. We could have some other ways, um, some other things you could do too within this. Um, this, if you're working on a project, like you're going to be using coming back to the same data set, the same script. In this right hand corner, there's a project you can actually create a, like a separate bin. So it's going to be a snapshot version of R. It's going to have your data in there. So you don't have to do set working directory if you're working in a project. It's it's an isolated project, which is really nice. But if you're using the same code over and over again for different projects, it, it becomes less beneficial. So it really depends on your workflow. Um, but yeah, great question so far. Loving that. Great. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and... Oh, my... I'm going to go ahead and stop installing uh, Medicunda because uh, it's going to take a little bit. But the, yeah, the nice thing is you can have R talk to Python and leverage both of, oh, sorry, I'm getting error messages. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, benefits of live coding. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I know some, uh, there's some, Users in the HPC that use reticulate heavily. Um, so it's, it really, sometimes like R doesn't have the functions that Python has or vice versa. So it just makes it so much easier than having to write your own code within this. But what we do now is um, kind of shifting gears. We're going to go ahead and let's import the data set. So I'm going to go ahead and call this HS. So I'm just creating an object name. And I'm just going to use the equal symbol now for this one. And what I like to do is if I'm using just a single function, uh, just once from a package, I'll name the package. Then I do two colons. So this is saying rather than activating the package, I'm just saying, well, I just want to use this one function from it. And then I can go ahead and use, so I'm using just the import function from Rio. I'm going to use double quotes. And I like to use tab because then I can go ahead and just locate it. Again, I can also kind of see here what the file name is. It is cap sensitive, space sensitive, and character sensitive. So you just want to make sure it's exactly the way the file name is. If there's a space or not a space, that will make a huge difference. Um, I always highly recommend anything you're naming in R as an object name or as like as a variable name, keep it short because otherwise you're gonna to have to do a lot of typing and it's just increasing the possibility of making a mistake. So I'm gonna go ahead and import this and it's quick. So I can go ahead and now we have HS as a data or data frame. I can expand this by pressing the little blue button and I can see here are some different variables. What I like to do is I like to double click on it. And then this opens up a little spreadsheet. I can't edit this one, so just a just a view only. But I can see what the variables are in my data set. I can see all the different ones, or all the different rows. So this is a wide format. So each row is a separate individual. And I can go ahead, I can, let's see, there's only 15 columns. So there's not a whole lot of data in here, but it's, I can go ahead and I can sort. I can also, if I wanted to, I can filter just for visuals. So if I wanted just 14 year olds, I'd be able to get that information. Let me turn off the filter. So Eric, you've got a question, another question. I don't know if you've already answered it. Can you explain what the set WD do? Oh, yep. Um, I already answered that question. Okay. Sorry. No worries. Um, so once you have the data set in there, I'd like to do a quick check of it just to make sure everything's looking correct in here. Um, if sometimes if you have multiple rows that have like, if you download from Qualtrics, you're going to have like the first three rows, it's just going to be variable information and it's going to throw everything out of whack. So I like to just to import and just get a quick sense of like, does the data structure make sense? Does this like 
is this kind of what it should look like? Um, what we can then do too is I'm gonna go down to the next chunk and just check the structure because it's always good to get a sense of your data. And that's what really R forces you to do. It really forces you to get a really good sense of what your data is, the structure of it, because there'll be some things you can do and some things you can't do based on just the structure. So we can see ID, it's a, it's a numerical value from one to 300. We have uh, sex, which is characters. So I'm gonna have to change this variable around. So I always do this too, just to see, okay, what do I need to change? What do I need to, to fix within this? So I get all the attribute informations in there and how it's reading it in. All this looks good, so I'm not too worried. If you don't want to do like double clicking on HS to see the whole data set, you can also do things like, I'll do this under STR. You can use the head statement. And that's gonna just print out the first six observations, or you can use tail HS. And that's gonna give you the last six observations. So this is a really quick way just to double check that your data is being read in correctly. Because uh, if it's not being read in correctly and you don't catch it early, it can just become a headache later on. Um, so now that that looks pretty good, let's go ahead and I'm going to show you a couple of things you can do too with just data checking. There's the glimpse function. And it kind of gives you a snapshot um, it gives you the type of variable, so DBL, so numeric, uh, character, just a quick snapshot, and then some examples of the first couple of rows. You can also do something like, oh, this is a fun one, a skimmer package. So skimmer is a quick way to skim the data set. So I'm using the skimmer package, two colons and then saying use the function from the skimmer package called hs what this is going to do oh i have to save it first okay is so it gives me information about the data so how many values number of columns how many are numeric how many are character and kind of a really quick gauge of just the data set so it's another way of kind of looking at it and also tell you if there's any missingness and kind of the ranges within that. Uh, so if it's complete, it's one. If there's any a number of missing, there's no missing data within this one, which I purposely did. But it's a quick way to screen your data. Um, let's do some uh, reformatting. So within the data set, we can see that school is a character. So what I would probably want to do is I would want to rename these. Let me just take a quick look at this. So we have school one, two. Uh, so these have a, these are two different schools and I can go ahead and I can change that around. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, just for time, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the completed code. Um, just cause I'm afraid I start making mistakes and all of that. But so what I do is, I'm going to talk through each of the codes within this and start. we can start running stuff. So if I wanted to recode school, so rather than just a one or a two, it actually lists like what school, like Grant White, which was a one, or Pastor, which was a two. We can have that become a factor. The nice thing is we can run a regression later on, and then it automatically dummy codes things out for us too. So this is really great for nominal variables. So we can use the factor function. And then what we have here is we have, oh, I made I made a headache for myself. Um, so what I did was in one, I, code, I called it one thing, and then this one, I called it something else. So let me go ahead and fix that. So I called it HS when I first pulled it in. So I'm making a duplicate of HS and calling it HS1939. That way, this code all works without issue. So I said you just made a copy of the data set. And you can do that easily with an R. So you can have, um, if you wanted to, for version control, have a copy of it and then make modifications to the data or manipulations to that data set. You have something to go back to really quickly. Um, so here what we're doing is we're saying the HS1939 data set, I want to change the format of the variable called school. So that's where we see the object name dollar sign 
variable name. And so we're just going to change this and say, okay, the levels, so the values of one and two, I want R to change all those ones to grant white. All those two are going to be called pastor. So what we're doing is we're essentially just recoding and reformatting those ones and those twos. You can also create a variable that's going to be ordinal. So like a bronze, silver, gold, uh, first, second, third, or or like a grade, where there is this ordered sequence to them. Within this, we have a variable called grade, which is seventh or eighth grade. So rather than treat that as a nominal, there is this hierarchical structure to it. So I'd want to maintain that data structure. So I can use an ordered function. And I'm saying our data frame, dollar sign, variable name. And I'm saying, uh, just take the same values because within the data set, if I look at grade, it's seventh grade. So it's not like a one, two. It's literally just those characters. So I'm just saying what those labels are and putting it in the specific order. So seventh grade first, eighth grade next. And so when I do that, if I go back to my data set here, well, there's the school with an ordered. And now we have an ordered factor for grade. So that way we can get a sense of what that looks like. The benefit here is... Let me, I'm going to make a couple changes here. So rather than, let's look at school. If I wanted to look at school and just get the, the frequencies, I can use the table function. I refer to my data frame and then the specific variable of interest. So I have 144 responses from Grant White and 156 from Pastor School. So that's a quick way to do this. And that's just the, the counts. What we can then do is we can also then, once we, we start cleaning up the data set, uh, reformatting things, making sure that things are in the structure that, that you like or that how you want to work with it, now you can then move to like descriptive statistics. So the base function, which is ugly in my opinion, very, very ugly, is just summary. So I just do summary and then the object name. Here we're just going to refer to our, our data set. And it gives us minimum, the maximum, the mean, first and third quarter quartile, and then mean and median. If it's a if it's a factor, we get that information. But this one's this character it doesn't know how to deal with it, so we didn't take care of sex there. But if we went back and fixed it, we'd be able to get the counts. So I mean, it's okay. It's not great. I don't like it. So what I like to use, I use, I use the psych package. This has a describe function, which gives us a little bit more specificity. Because now I get the, so for each variable, I have the variable position, how many observations I have, what's the mean, standard deviation, median, trimmed mean, uh, minimum, maximum, and then skewness, cretaceous, and standard error of the estimate. So I get that for all my variables with little asterisks for anything that's either a character or a factor or an ordered factor. Because it's like, yeah, I'm going to give that to you, but it doesn't make sense. That's why there's that little asterisk there. If you're doing frequency tables, I would highly recommend the table functions from the janitor package. What this does is we just list within table, function, the data frame, and then the variable name. And we get our frequencies as well as the percentage. Uh, so this is really, really great for quick reports. Um, something I do as part of CTL is I keep track of software licenses, of software that we have licensed for and that we support. Uh, so what I do is every couple of months, I generate reports of what's the usage, um, what schools are using certain softwares, just to get like a, a pulse check. So I actually do all that with an R, and I kind of just take this and extract it into a report. So it just it makes it easier because I could just change the input data, run it, and it's good to go. The other thing you do too is summary tools. This is a fun one. Um, so what we do here is it's a different library. It's going to give us summary of statistics, and we're just saying view. So we have a in Python, this would be like a a, a chain function within this or chaining. But say so we have like a DS summary, and then we're going to view after running that. So we can go ahead and run that. And then the nice thing is it gives you a data frame summary. For each variable, it's going to give you the statistics. If it's continuous or if it's factor, 
the percentages. It's going to give you quick graphs. You can actually look at a quick visual of the distributions. It's going to tell you how many are valid and how many missing. So this is a really, really nice, quick check of your data set. It also tells you the number of distinct values as well. So it's a really, really great way to screen. Um, I always try to spend more time screening data than running analysis. Just uh, I'm always kind of a, the mindset measure twice, cut once, so to speak. You can also do things like a code book. So uh, this is using a package called CodeBooker. And what this does is it creates, it's going to actually create a code book for you. So it's an automatic code book. Um, it, take that with a grain of salt, because I do have it as a docx here, because I like to modify it. Um, I'm going to let that run for a second. It's going to, oh, it's already done. And within my working directory, I can pull up my code book. And apologies, I like working in a dark format just because with coding, it just makes it easier to run for me. So I'm not straining my eyes. But we can have for each variable, it's going to give you the data type, if there's any missingness, frequencies, uh, min, max, mean, standard deviation for all your variables that you have in your data set. So it, it's not a really detailed code book, but it's a good starting point that you can then add to it. So this also, if you want to do like APA tables, we can use the APA tables function. So I'm just saying, give me an APA core table from APA tables. And I can go ahead and get this. It looks better when you export this into a Word doc, but it gives you the variable names, mean, standard deviation column, and then a correlational matrix for all of it with uh, the 95% CI around that correlation of the Pearson R. Um, it also gives you the asterisks for statistical significance. I have thoughts on that, but I'm not going to worry about that. So this is all kind of just how you can describe your data. I um, also want to kind of be mindful of the time. So I'm going to do a couple of different tests within this. Um, just kind of show you some of the functionality of what you can do with this. So like if you wanted to run an independent samples t-test. So first thing you want to do is... Uh, Equal variances of a, of a uh, equal equality of the variances assumption Levine's test because uh, the variability of a score for group one is different from group two statistically so that's going to be an issue. So what we can do is we're going to run Levine's test this is from the car package, and what we're saying is cubes based on a group variable based on on school. So cubes is a, a cube. Uh, I think it's a cube rotation score. We, ref we reference our data set, and I'm centering at the mean. You can also do a median, which is a little bit more robust, but we're just going to do just the standard mean because that's what most other softwares do. So here we can see, okay, we don't have statistical significance. Our p-value is greater than 0 0.050, so we don't see statistical significant differences between our cube scores based on what school someone was in. Now, this format, that's going to be like kind of our outcome regressed on a variable. So it's going to be that same outcome when we get to regression or ANOVAs because it's all part of the general linear model. Um, something fun here you can do is if you want to look at descriptive statistics by different groups, I can say what my group or what my outcome variable is or what variable I'm interested, what my grouping variable is. And I do mat equals true because it makes it easier to see, it gives you in a single data frame rather than multiple data frames. But it splits, it subsets the data for you so you get what's the mean for one school, what's the mean for the other school, as well as standard deviations. So this is a really, really nice way to kind of slice and dice your data. Um, we can also do, once we have that Levine's test, now we know, okay, I can run an independent samples t-test now. So if it's not, if equal variances aren't met, you would just change var dot equal equals true to false, and that's adjust for it. So we're regressing cubes on school. So actually, it's just an impassable t-test. We have our data frame. And if there's any missing data, remove that, which is just list-wise deletion. Um, so we have then our t-statistic, our degrees of freedom, and our p-value, not this is significant. And we get the 95% confidence interval around our difference in the means for each group. So we say, okay, there's no difference here. If we want to get Cohen's D, this is from a different package. 
using Cohen's D, we just kind of put that same equation as our independent samples T test. And it's going to give us our Cohen's D effect size. So honestly, no significant differences. It was a negligible effect size, so I'm not really surprised. Um, the nice thing with R is you can do some really great visualizations. Um, if you're interested in that, let me know. I have a whole learning module. Actually, I have a whole Canvas uh, Canvas course that's just R learning module. So if you're interested in being added to that, let me know. They're all self-paced. And they have a bunch of different code in there they can kind of go through. Uh, but this is a really quick way of taking a quick look at box plots and kind of seeing, well, what's the distribution for each of those schools for cubes? Again, it's a really basic, basic visualization. R can do some really pretty stuff, but again, just the basics. Um, I'm going to skip over the one-way ANOVA. I'm just going to talk through, I'm going to do the same thing here. We're just creating a new variable for grouping. But then we'd be able to run an ANOVA and then do a post hoc test. Um, same thing with factorial. I'm just going to jump down to a regression just for time, though. Actually, it's, let's skip down to correlation. So it's going to be similar to that APA table that we ran before. This is just a different way that I like to use personally because it gives me the different parameters. And let me go ahead and just rerun that. So I think it looks a little bit better. I would need to probably squish this a little bit here too. There we go, that's better. So I can actually see what's um, variable one with this other variable, what the R is. I mean, with these IDs, that wouldn't make any sense, but it's a really, really quick way to look at what's the Pearson R, the 95% CI around that, our T statistic, and our PU value. So I like this personally. I feel like the standard matrix, that's great too. Do it works for you. Um, but I found this as a quick way to kind of skim through stuff. Regression, uh, because t-test and NOVA, they're all the same thing. They're all regression or special case of regression. Let's talk about that for a few minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and activate some regression specific libraries. So that's car, LM test, and y hat. I just run those just so we have the functions that we need. Um, we can then look at descriptive statistics, see, okay, is there any issues with our data set before we start running stuff? So within this, I'd be able to go like, okay, I can click through and kind of see what my skewness is, what my kurtosis is. It, it looks pretty good. I can then check my distribution. So a lot of this is kind of just assumption checking first, just to make sure there's not going to be any issues with it later. And then some box plots. So actually, when we get down to the model, whenever you want to run an ordinary least squares regression, it's going to be LM, our outcome variable, and then tilde is essentially regressed on. So we have our cubes and lozenges. We have a sex in school. We actually have an interaction here too within this. And then OLS. So if I run this, what it does is even though we never went back and fixed sex, it was able to see the pattern. And so this is sex for male compared to our reference group of female. It automatically dummy codes alphabetically the first in or the first code within this. So the grant white, that was our reference group for school. So we look at controlling all of the variables in the model, holding those constant, going from female to male, what that estimate was. We can also see that we don't have a, a significant interaction here too. So we can add a little asterisk and that's gonna go ahead and that's our interaction term. So it's really powerful. The nice thing is if we have more than two factors, it automatically dummy codes it out for you. So you don't have to create dummy codes within this. Um, it's a huge, huge plus. We can do things like a glance, which we can look at then the model fit statistics, just for the overall omnibus model. And we can extract our coefficients. So we have, because we saved the object or the results as its own object here, we can have some fun with that. So now we can go ahead and we can extract. So in the results, there's a something called coefficients. So let me go ahead and pull this up so you can see a little bit clearer. So we have OLS results. If I click on it, this is what's within this object. 
So we have the coefficients for each. We have the residuals for each individual in our data set. We also have our fitted values. These are our predicted values based on a regression equation. So it stored all of that as an object. So from there, we can then go ahead and we can extract them. We can also, if we wanted to print our coefficients to like a, a CSV file or an Excel sheet, we can do that. So that way we can just go ahead and use those or report those. I can also extract my fitted values. So what's my predicted values for each individual given this equation? And I can get the fitted values in there too. Um, so some really nice things you can do within this. Um, you can also look at the diagnostic plots too. So there's a couple of different ways for diagnostics. There's the augment package. Uh, and the, I'm just, I know these packages just because of Google searches are just trying things out and seeing what I like. Um, so this is kind of what I like, but you don't have to use some of these packages. Find what works out best for you. Um, so we can look at outliers, like Cook's D automatically calculates it for us. So we have our data sets and it appends new values to it. So we can see if there's anyone for Cook's D that might be an outlier. We can also look at different plots. Our QQ plots, these are a mess. So I don't like using those defaults. What I like to do is, I'm gonna skip down a little bit, is use the performance package in C. And I can think, do things like get the R squared, AIC, but I like using check model. What this does is it checks my regression model against some of the common assumptions. Oh, um, what did it not like? Huh. I'll have to go back and figure out what's going on with that one. Um, but I'm going to go ahead. Oh, there it is. Yeah, sometimes if it does that, just go ahead and rerun it, and that should fix it. But the... Oh, I know what happened because we didn't go back and fix X within this when I was doing it. Um, so that created an issue for the predictive checks. Um, but typically what you would have is you'd have some visualizations of homogeneity of variances, collinearity, and some quick checks there too. The You can also do things like check for heterogeneity of variances. So checking for that, they appear to be homoscedastics. That's great. You do the same thing with like uh, Bru Bush Pagan test, which I know some folks do. It's going to give you the same results pretty much. And then check more normality. So there's different ways you can check it. This one, there's non-normality residuals, so I know I have an issue here. But I can go through these different things. Um, I love Y hat package because of this. This is called Regger. Um, so it gives you beta weight structure coefficients commonality analysis. So if you have multicollinearity, um, this is a way to bypass all those issues. Um, because it gives you how, what's the breakdown, what's unique to each variable, and then what is uh, shared. So you can actually think of it as like a Venn diagram. But there's a lot of things here. Uh, but if you wanted to export it, if it, let's say you clean the data and you want to put it into like a Stata data file, I can actually just say Rio export the object or the data frame name, and then say give it a make it into a Stata DTA file. Or maybe I want it as an SPSS file. So all those transformations and recoding I've done, I could port that into another data frame for someone else to use. Um, so this, I know I skipped over a lot of different stuff just for time. I want to make sure because I, I put more code in here that we probably could have gone through. But I wanted to give you more information that you can play around with and try things with. The There's a lot you can do. And just big things is kind of just experiment. Um, you can't break R. Um, just try different things and just Google search. Again, Google is your friend. Um, so I want to be really mindful too with the time because the session ends at 3.15. So I actually wanted to spend like the last eight or so minutes to open up if you have questions, if you want to talk through things. Um, if there's a kind of specific analysis that you're interested in, that either if I have materials for or mod modules on, I can share those with you. Or if it's something that you'd, you'd love to learn, because we're already starting to think about, well, what's what the program is going to be for the spring semester. So I'd love to hear what you all are interested in and interested in learning, because I can really do some like some more tailored programming in the future.
So I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then, yeah, just uh, let me know if there's kind of specific things that you're interested in or if you have specific questions. I'd love to hear from you all.